Jim Hoffman here for EMS Office Hours. This is your Monday Minutes. Uh, one thing that uh, I don't cover too much on Monday Minutes are pediatric issues. And um, I thought today would be a good time and a good opportunity to go ahead and, and talk a little bit about uh, bradycardia in your pediatric patients. Um, not seen all that often. Uh, and normally these patients are going to be pretty crappy looking. Um, and you know, you're going to be focused on the heart rate. Uh, but there are some things that you should consider when you are assessing these patients. And when you talk about considering these things and, and thinking ahead is your training, you know, you've trained for patient assessment, assessing pediatrics, adults, or all variations of patients, right? So when you get a patient like this, um, you know, this is sort of a critical type of a patient, right? You don't want to go beyond that bradycardia, right? Uh, and you want to be able to rely on your training, rely on your skills to be able to assess the patient properly and treat them properly, okay? And treating them properly is based, of course, upon your skill level and upon the guidelines that are within your area. So what I'm going to show you here, just some basic uh, assessment and uh, treatments, but of course your treatments might be more or less than what I'm showing, um, might be more specific. So always rely on your local guidelines, of course, when you're considering treating uh, any patients uh, based on what I try to show you here on the Monday Minute. So you get a patient, pediatric patient, they're bradycardic. Think about the patient's history. You know, do they do they have a foreign body ingestion? Um, maybe respiratory distress that that lead to cardiac arrest or leads to um, apnea, right? It's all going to be going into the bradycardia, right? Respiratory arrest and the respiratory distress, respiratory distress and the respiratory arrest is going to, of course, lead the patient to becoming uh, bradycardic, and apnea might lead the patient to become bradycardic. Think about maybe any exposure to a toxin or some type of poison. Think about a patient that might have some sort of congenital disease, right? Congenital heart disease or a medication that the patient might be under or even if they're breastfeeding, uh, a medication that the mom might be on. All things to sort of consider. And I know, again, like I mentioned before, think about your training because this is when you're going to have to start really putting together all the things that are going on and when you're attaining your your history of, of the patient and the history of the present illness of all the things that you have to consider, okay? So we talk about past medical history here as the first thing. What else is going on that might have caused the bradycardia, okay? Now, signs and symptoms, of course, a decreased heart rate, right? Cyano cyanosis, delayed cap refill, mild, cool skin, uh, maybe hypotensive, maybe in cardiac arrest or respiratory arrest. Um, and an altered level of consciousness. All of these might be there. Uh, maybe a few of them might be there, okay, depending upon at what stage your patient is at when you get there or what is causing the bradycardia. Now, what are some things you could think about? And I mentioned this before, right? Respiratory failure, that can cause bradycardia. Um, a foreign body or secretions that are blocking the airway, okay, causing that bradycardia. Think about patients that might have an infection, something like croup or, or epiglottitis, right? Or hypovolemia, and hypovolemia caused by things, by dehydration, right? The pediatric patient has been vomiting a lot, a lot of diarrhea. That type of hypovolemia, you know, cause to give that bradycardia. And again, like I mentioned, the congenital heart disease, trauma, right? Think about, it, has the patient had any sort of recent injury? Maybe there's a tension pneumo going on, hypothermia, toxins or medications, like I mentioned. Hypoglycemia, believe it or not, can cause uh, bradycardia and the acidosis. All the things that you can think about that's causing the bradycardia. And while your treatment for the bradycardia might be focused on getting the heart rate up, if you can take the history that we mentioned and try to figure out what's causing it, Right, and using that differential, you can treat maybe some of these causes that's causing the bradycardia to correct it. Okay, some of them, of course, are, you need more aggressive treatment than others, and it might be different guidelines where you are, where, you know, how you're going to treat a patient. Other things that's hypoglycemic, or a patient that's in respiratory failure, or some who, or pediatric patients who had a trauma, all might fall under different guidelines 
okay? And you might be moving from one protocol, one guideline to another to correct the issues that are going on with the patient, okay? Very tricky, guys, because, you know, pediatric patients can't always tell you what's going on, and you've got to sit there and go, go by what family, friends, and whatnot are telling you, okay? Now, your assessment. The patient might be hypotensive caused by the bradycardia, maybe altered mental status, uh, poor perfusion, or even shock, right? Now, think about this. We mentioned before respiratory arrest, rest, respiratory distress, right? If the patient, the foreign body, okay, if the patient's airway is not potent, if they're not getting good oxygenation, ox, oxygenation they're not got good ventilation going on, right? What are you going to have to do? You got to go manage that airway, okay? Because anything else you do is not going to be able to help. So you, you got a patient whose airway is not patent and they're not getting good oxy, oxygenation um, and their ventilations aren't very good, you're going to have to go and move to the airway guidelines to manage that airway, okay? And again, that might be within the same guideline, depending upon where you, where you are. Um, but again, that is what you're going to go into. So all the ultimate status and perfusion and shock and all that, can't do anything about that until you can manage that patient's airway, okay? I'm going some more assessment and treatment. Try to identify the cause, like I mentioned, those differentials that I mentioned, right? Move to the prop appropriate protocols, okay? Get the get a blood sugar. Maybe they are hypoglycemic, right? And try to address and reassess the patient after you've identified some maybe some simple causes and maybe be able to quickly treat them, right? Re reassess the patient after you address them. At the patient. Um, you know, continues to have the bradycardia, continues with poor perfusion, and continues with the shock, then you're going to go to the more aggressive treatment, things like, like normal saline boluses, like epinephrine, like atropine, okay, and maybe even considering pacing the patient. And this is all going to be guided by your local guidelines, your skill level, and your skill level um, as well, right? These are some of the common uh, dosages for epi and atropine, uh, and for normal saline boluses for pediatric patients, um, a lot of times there's maximum, like atropine, usually the maximum of the single dose would be one milligram. Uh, your epi max dose would be one milligram, okay? Um, so things like that, okay? And of course, the pacing you got to consider as well. If that's something that's, that's an option for you and that's something that your patient might be falling into for potential uh, uh, treatment, then you're going to want to use the appropriate pads that that are going to be for whatever patient size you have. And of course, don't forget, guys, we've got dosages here. We've got uh, kilograms going on, right? If you most systems, you use the brothel tape, your PD wheel, things like that. Use that to help you guide your dosaging, okay, with it, okay? A little bit more now, of course, if you try to treat, you've, you've done some, you've done your assessment, your reassessment, heart rate stays below 60, patient still got that poor perfusion, still has the chunky symptoms, then most of the time you're going to move to those cardiac arrest guidelines where you see that the heart rate's below 60, they tell you to do what? Start CPR, right? So again, this is going to be depending upon your guidelines, your protocols, okay, what you can do first, what you shouldn't do, okay? Um, I think most of the time, most of us, if we've got a patient who looks shocky, they got poor perfusion, uh, and the heart rate is below 60, we're going to be going right into the CPR guidelines, and then we're going to be doing all the other things we mentioned in the previous pages as far as epi and atropine, uh, high, treating hypoglycemia, things like that, after we started the cardiac arrest guidelines. Okay, we're not going to be sitting there jerking around with blood blood sugar levels and things like that if the patient is circling the drain and their heart rate is below 60, okay? We're going to probably move right into the uh, ACLS guidelines, the PALS guidelines, and do start doing compressions on the patient. And then we'll treat the other things that we might think is going on, like the hypoglycemia or hypovolemia and things like that, once we get the, the CPR going and get the airway and whatnot managed, okay? So... What are some of the keys? I mentioned some of these already as we've been going along, but um, you know, your main assessment is, of course, your mental status, your head, ear, head, ears, eyes, nose, mouth, and throat, this patient's skin, their heart, their lungs, their abdomen, their back, extremities, and neurological, right? Try to, uh, that's like your main focus assessment there, okay? And remember, don't forget, this is why I mentioned earlier about moving to 
are respiratory and airway management is because the majority of the pediatric arrests that you're going to wind up having that evolved to pediatric arrest is due to airway problems, those foreign bodies, the croup, the epiglottitis, um, you know, secretion and things like that. Okay. Now, don't forget, like I mentioned too, the mom takes drugs, she's breastfeeding. A lot of them can pass through the breast milk to the infant. So always make sure you ask if the patient is, is uh, breastfeeding, what type of medications mom is on as well. That might help you do it. Okay, it might help you figure out what, what might be going on and might not figure maybe the patient might be toxic from medication. And then you're going to move to, let's say, a toxic, pediatric toxicology type uh, guideline. Okay, and don't forget, hypoglycemia, Severe dehydration and narcotic effects. Okay, again, breast milk patient. You know, your mom might be doing some uh, uh, illicit drugs, right? Passes to the infant, right? So, all might produce the bradycardia. Okay, keep all these things in mind. I know it's a lot to sort of focus on, a lot to think about. You want to follow, follow your local guidelines, of course, as always, right? But the main thing is, guys is you want to don't want that patient circling the drain getting to the point where a point of no return okay you get them bradycardic bradycardic and you see that they have poor perfusion and they're shocky you're going to move to the palate guidelines you're going to start cpr and all the other things that you that i've talked about as far as differentials of what might be causing the bradycardia what might be causing um the poor perfusion right you can address that once you get that cpr going you can start fi trying to figure out what might be going on and maybe by correcting that after the fact you can re help reverse the bradycardia at that point so i hope you can use some of these monday minutes guys i hope that uh you know i covered a lot of the uh, key elements here again not can't go into it this is the type of thing where you can talk about an entire lecture for an hour on something like this um so i'm trying to hit some key areas here give you some key treatment modalities and, and more important i think uh, some key differentials. We all know that patients, that pediatric patients that are bradycardic like that, we're going to start CPR, right? But I'm trying to give you some of the differentials and things to think about of why the patient might be bradycardic and why, you know, what you can do to help reverse it. Okay, guys, I hope you can, again, I hope you can use these. If you want to get some great um, tips on mastering the assessment of pediatric patients, um, go check out this uh, video. Uh, webcast that, that we did a little while back and it's got some really great um, uh, assessment skills and techniques that you can use for all of your pediatric patients okay and I got them listed here some of the key areas here that, that were on this this session uh, as far as forming a general impression and, and techniques and uh, the proper history like I mentioned and even in this pro in this little video here um, you know and things about age appropriate appropriate communication right uh, how to assess vowel signs and pain recognition in a pediatric patient, okay? And performing procedures like IVs and things like that in a pediatric, pediatric patient. Then think about the last time you had a splint or spinal immobilize a pediatric patient, right? All tricky stuff, all things we have to assess, and we and it might not be as often that we do get pediatric patients, but we do get them. And I think that uh, short videos like this or even a larger video like this, Pediatric Assessment Essentials here, can really help you master pediatric assessments okay little by little guys so go check this out uh, just click this join now button and you'll be taken to the main page for this video uh, recording and you'll get more details on what's all included there as far as mp3 uh, downloads for it uh, other uh, download and, and resources you can get uh, by checking out this uh, video webinar. So I hope this helps you again, guys. Um, as always, go check out emsofficehours.com for some more uh, videos and the podcast that we do every week, every Sunday. And uh, hopefully we'll see you on an upcoming episode of uh, EMS Office Hours. Get you in the chat room or maybe even calling in on a topic that we're talking about. Until next week, guys, as always, this is Jim Hoffman for EMS Office Hours in the Monday Minutes. Stay safe.